Well, well, well. I thought I might never live to see this day, but it finally happened. Kirby has gone full 3D, and it is glorious. Perhaps my new favorite Kirby game, in fact. That or The Amazing Mirror. I'll need some time to simmer on it and uh, make up my mind properly. But anyways, point being, the game is great. Now, if you are unfamiliar with my channel, then you should know that I have attempted to beat loads of Kirby games without jumping. To various degrees of success, and I can't wait to see how such a challenge plays out in a 3D space. So let's not wait. Is it possible to beat Kirby and the Forgotten Land without jumping? Okay, now before we start exploring this new world, we need to establish what exactly we mean by not jumping. I'm defining specifically and exactly the moves jump and hover as the moves we're barring for this challenge. We are not, however, just outright banning any use of the A button. So we can still, for example, talk to people and use moves outside of standard jumping, like the slide, or later upward slash, without breaking our rules. I hope that's clear and acceptable to you all. Honestly, it would have just felt wrong to me if our rules had somehow ended up banning the Upward Slash, which is a move that has served us so well in the past. Anyway, outside of jumping and hovering, we can use any mechanics present in the game to hopefully make our way all the way through the game to the final boss and see the credits roll. Now let's get started. Our favorite pink puffball awakens on a mysterious beach, and we get to, for the first time, experience Kirby gameplay in 3D. Moving's all good, we can still inhale, Blocking and dodging is present, and swimming seems pretty straightforward. Okay, let's venture into that jungle. Here we encounter the game's jumping tutorial. Now typically, encountering a jumping tutorial without a copy ability is game over for one of these challenges. Well, that's because typically the moves we rely on in the stead of jumping, or jump replacements as I like to call them, are derived from copy abilities. So I guess this is jump number one then. But not so fast. This is 3D Kirby, need I remind you, and Kirby's dodge has been greatly upgraded for the third dimension. See, when you dodge now, you actually gain a little height with this little hop here, which acts as a small jump replacement. I highly doubt its meager height alone will be able to get us through the rest of the game, but for this obstacle specifically, it works just fine. Next, the game gives us a bit of a taste of combat, just before the hovering tutorial. But fear not, before that hovering tutorial, the game kindly gives us access to a copy ability. Sword. Sword has historically been a great copy ability for these no jump challenges, thanks to its upward slash. Luckily for us, that move has survived the transition to 3D, though it does need to specifically be done out of a drill stab, which is fine. That isn't really a difficult combination of moves to pull off, so we can still use it quite easily. It seems to get about as much height as a normal jump, which should be sufficient for most obstacles, though it's not great at clearing particularly wide gaps. Additionally, there's no way to fly with it in this game. The only follow-up you can get out of it is a slam straight into the ground. But is it enough to get past the hovering tutorial without jumping? Seemingly not. The upward slash's height is a bit more than a Kirby short of what it would need to be to reach the roof we're aiming for. I looked around to see if maybe we could use a short platform somewhere as a stepping stone to the roof, but they were all too far away to be of use. Part of the issue is that the drill stab always stops at the edge of the platform you're standing on, which is great if you're trying to not fall off a ledge, but not so great if you're trying to maximize the horizontal movement of your jump replacement. That's what normally happens anyway. But this barrel is a bit different. This part right next to the wall, for whatever reason, doesn't stop your drill stab from going off the edge. That allows us to activate the upward slash in mid-air, closer to where we're trying to go. Which still isn't enough to get us onto the roof. But it is enough to land us on this sign right next to the roof. From there, we can dodge onto the roof, thus overcoming the obstacle. 
We're then presented with another terrace of the roof to get to, which is again just out of reach of an upward slash. Subverting this one is a much simpler matter though, you just have to upward slash from the nearby railing. I then foolishly trade my sword for bomb, which doesn't have any jump replacements. Luckily we don't need any to get to this garage and experience our first taste of this game's chief gimmick, mouthful mode. In this case, Kirby acquires a car. Now the moves the car has access to is the ability to go turbo and jump. Obviously we'd like to abstain from participating in the latter activity, and luckily for us, at least in this introductory car area, jumping is entirely optional. We dodge our way through the rubble in the next area before blowing up some beasts and meeting with Elfillin and Bendeno Waddle That marks the end of the tutorial area. So yes, we actually made it through the entire tutorial without jumping this time. I'm liking our odds already. Alright, let's get into the first real level, Downtown Grassland. Here we try out Cutter, which proves disappointing in the jump replacement department. I mean, I guess technically the final cutter might be able to be used on occasion, but let's be honest, it's not going to. We come across a vending machine briefly, but honestly not much comes of that. We then come across a ledge too high for us to dodge up. It's at times like these that you really wish you hadn't abandoned sword earlier. But actually, as it turns out, if you get the right angle right near the edge of the world, you can make it up. I don't question it. After some nice flatness, we encounter another mouthful power-up, the Cone. Now the Cone, I like. Cone has one jump replacement, the Spike Downward, in which Kirby rises up into the sky before, well, spiking downwards. It provides decent height and is a pretty good attack. What more could you ask for? We then have a boss fight against Wild Edge, which goes quite well, and even lets us get our sword back. Then, with the combination of sword and cone, the remainder of the level is relatively simple. Next up is Through the Tunnel, where we get a taste of fire. Unfortunately, you only turn into a redless fireball if you're already in mid-air when you press the attack button. And even if you do that, it can't really be used to gain height. We get through most of the level though, with Bandana Waddle Dee sometimes being called upon to grab some cages and the like, until this ledge stops us dead in our tracks. Now you may be thinking that Bandana Waddle Dee could help here, but unfortunately Bandana Waddle Dee's utility is severely hampered by the fact that the camera does not follow him at all, and Kirby has no way to warp to him. So in spite of how good his spearcopter is, and it's certainly great for grabbing items, he really can't help us much for obstacles that Kirby has to physically get past, which is what this obstacle is. Oh well, guess we'll need to go back and use Sword here instead. And man, having access to the Upward Slash really is a world of difference, even giving us access to some secrets that we were barred from with fire. The level culminates with the stairs section that proves no threat to our jumpless run. Next stop, Rocky Rollin' Road. Here we're introduced to Spike, which has no jump replacement utility and honestly very little in the way of general utility, as well as Ranger, which can shoot but not provide a jump replacement. That's not to say we can't use it. Remember, basically all copy abilities have access to dodging, and if we need to reach some item very high up, there's always the option of summoning in Bandana Waddle Dee with multiplayer to grab it for us. Anyway, Ranger proves sufficient to get us to this car section, which mercifully requires zero jumps. And we even drove without falling off the edge. Which, as it turns out, gave us a free Waddle Dee. Sweet! I suppose now would be as good a time as any to bring up the captured Waddle Dees. If you're familiar with the 3DS Kirby games, then the captured Waddle Dees are effectively this game's stand-in for sunstones or code cubes. You need a certain amount of them from each world to unlock that world's boss. Additionally, the more you get, the more establishments you unlock in Waddle Dee Town. The ways you can get them are by beating levels, finding them hidden within the levels, and fulfilling unique objectives in each level. Which varies significantly, whether not falling off a certain part of the level, as we just saw in the last level, leading ducklings to their mother, or a myriad of other tasks. Now obviously some of these Waddle Dees will be unable to get without jumping, but there are so many of them and a lot of them we can get with only minor detours or by just playing the game how we were normally going to anyway. So I don't think it would be all that interesting to bring them all up in this video. For right now, I'll only mention captured Waddle Dees if either it becomes difficult for us to get enough of them to progress, or I might mention some specific ones if the process of getting them is particularly interesting but do know they exist, also know we aren't going to be focusing too much on them, because they're relatively easy to get, usually. 
Oh, also, treasure roads are a thing. These are short challenges built around the use of a specific copy ability or mouthful transformation that reward you with money and rare stones upon their completion. Rare stones are used to upgrade your copy abilities, so obviously we're going to want to pick up at least a few. And we do just that. Luckily, most of them aren't built around platforming with big jumps, so thus far we've been able to succeed at even ones that feature copy abilities and transformations that don't really have good jump placements. It's never mandatory to beat any specific treasure road, and we're definitely not aiming to fully upgrade every copy ability, so there's really not that much pressure associated with them. I'll just kind of be doing them as we go along, and if any of them turn out particularly interesting, I'll bring it up. But really, we're going to be focusing mostly on the main levels for this video. Like a trip to the mall, which is actually an incredibly easy level. You can tell because of the fact I ran around using Needle for the first half of it. We then switch to a more reasonable copy ability to finish it up. That unlocks the brawl at the mall, where we face Goromondo. And this fight really hits home how useful Kirby's dodge really is for combat. If you time it right, you even get some bolt time for a counterattack. So all in all, my assessment of the Goromondo fight jumpless is that it's more interesting than Kirby no jump boss fights normally are, but certainly easier than markets. Out, out of the way, out, out, out the way, out the way, oh my. Before moving on to the next world, we take the chance to upgrade Fire to Volcano Fire, which is certainly cooler, but isn't any better in the jump replacement department. Now as for that next world, it's a very water-themed world, which is a bold choice for a game with no underwater gameplay whatsoever. I guess we'll see what it's like then. So like I said, Kirby and the Forgotten Land does not have underwater gameplay at all. Instead, Kirby floats atop the surface of the water. From a practical perspective, this changes the physics of movement slightly and disables or modifies the use of certain moves. One modified move is the dodge, which no longer provides any elevation. That's obviously a bit of a problem since we need some way to reliably get out of water. Luckily, the drill, stab, and upward slash work the same way from the water's surface as they do from land. As such, we make sure to bring sword with us into this water world. In Abandoned Beach, we encounter sleep and are super surprised to find out that you have no jump replacements while you're unconscious. Who could have predicted that? Hammer also is very jump replacements lacking. Honestly, Sword does a pretty good job getting us through this first level. At the end of the level, we are presented with this ring, which we mostly just ignore without consequence. Before taking on the next level, we bring Hammer through this grueling treasure road. Yeah, you'd better hope your dodge is on point for this one. Anyway, now for Concrete Isles. Sword serves us very well in saving the first Waddle Dee, after which we discover a new copy ability, Drill. Drill's move Excavate is actually a pretty good jump replacement, or rather the part where you resurface is, launching Kirby a decent bit into the air. You can even then activate a little extra dash sort of maneuver while in midair for some extra distance. So it's pretty useful, but it does come with one glaring flaw, which is the fact that you can't use it everywhere such as on hard surfaces like metal or rock, or importantly from an immediate perspective, from the surface of water. So yeah, Drill's not exactly useful right now, but I'm sure it'll come up later. Later on in this level, we encounter a scissor lift, which doesn't even give you the option to jump. Unfortunately, what it leads to is only accessible by Drill, and right now we're using Sword. Luckily, this is an optional secret. Later on in the level, when the train becomes a bit more agreeable, we switch to Drill to find a secret, which is in the form of a pipe that tries to force us to jump. Luckily, it's optional. Aside from that misstep, the latter half of the level is practically built for Drill, aside from the last jump, which is over a pretty big gap from a metal platform. Thankfully, Kirby's dodge can get us just barely far enough to clear the gap and finish the level. Scale the Cement Summit introduces us to an interesting copy ability, Tornado. One could make the argument that Tornado doesn't actually have any useful jump replacements. I mean, the act of turning into a tornado gives a bit of height, but not even as much as a dodge does. And yes, Tornado can't gain height in a meaningful way. So in general, it's not a great copy ability for jump replacement purposes. But what Tornado can do is preserve height. If you direct your tornado off a ledge, it more or less maintains the same height as it had at the beginning of the move. This means that if we ever find ourselves needing to cross a large gap where the side we're trying to get to is of equal or lower height compared to the side we're coming from, in that instance, 
tornado can shine. For this level though, we just use it to cross some spikes before immediately switching it out for sword, and then the arch mass. And just so you know, the arch segments we can play entirely normally. Fast Flow Waterworks is a pretty annoying level, mostly because of the fact there is a bunch of water, which means we have to keep sword basically the whole way through. You pair that with the fact that the flowing nature of the water can make it difficult to recover your cop ability if you lose it, and yeah, this one took a few attempts. Eventually though, we run across a secret little known strategy called not getting hits, which proves surprisingly effective. The stairs part was pretty fun though. And what do you know, that unlocks the boss, Tropic Woods, which fire makes short work of, just like in Pokemon. Next is the first level of the third world. No, not that third world, alright, come on, this isn't a channel about geopolitics, it's about video games. Anyway, that level is Welcome to Wondaria, which introduces us to Roller Coaster Mode, in which you can't jump at all. Yay! We also get to use the Water Balloon Mode, in which you can technically jump, Boo! but there are so many refill spots here that you never have to. Yay! <sighs> That's awful. Anyways, next up is Circuit Speedway. Getting through this level is a relatively simple affair with Sword, until you get to the last car race, that is, which finally features a mandatory jump in a car section. Yeah, I tried just driving off this cliff, Sands jump, and it didn't work. And before you ask, no, the upward slash is not enough to allow you to make it over. But wait a minute. What if we tried Tornado? Well, first we've got to get through the rest of the level without access to the upward slash, which requires more deliberate, thought out navigation, but is possible. And then when we get to the jump, we just hop out of the car and tornado our way across, no jumps necessary. Oh, by the way, we finally got an upgrade for sword from that level, the Gigant Sword. The Gigant Sword has a slightly higher upward slash, though it's such a marginal difference that it almost never matters in practical use cases. The Giant Sword's block is also improved, though at the expense of removing dodging entirely from its moveset. So it's not a straight up replacement for sword, but certainly does have its use cases, like boss fights. Invasion at the House of Horrors is next, and features this light bulb section, which is a real pain because we at some parts have to leave the light bulb behind on account of it not having any good jump replacements, leading to us wandering around bottomless pit littered areas in total darkness. But believe it or not, that's not the worst of it. That honor goes to this timed platforming section, in which we feel the pain of Kirby's bouncing twice in his dodge. But ultimately, dodges are what we have to use here because upward slashes are simply too slow. It can be done though, so long as you're fast, dodge from the very edges of the platform, and pull back a bit once you've landed. Nothing else in the level really can compare to that obstacle. Then the Wondaria Parade is a relatively simple affair, wherein we use all three of our main jump replacement copy abilities. And the boss fight with Claw Roman is a fun time with Noble Ranger. Before moving on to the next world, we take part in the Meta Knight Cup at the Colosseum, which Gigant Sword absolutely annihilates. Beating that cup unlocks the Meta Knight Sword, which significantly improves the utility of the Upward Slash by adding in Upper Calibers you can follow it up with by pressing B. This improves the horizontal movement potential of swords significantly, and does act as an objectively better upgrade to the normal sword in all regards we care about. We also upgrade Drill to Pencil Drill, which isn't anything revolutionary, but is just in general a nice improvement. The first level in London is Northeast Frost Street, which Drill does pretty well in, aside from this instance of metal stairs that we had to call a Bandana Waddle Dee for. And this stairs section, which Bandana Waddle Dee can't solve for us. Back through with Sword we go, which actually goes much better. In Metron Eyes, we're really starting to face some more precise platforming, which upward slashes and spikes downwards luckily are still able to get us through. Until we reach this gap. And in case you're wondering, no, we can't just swim across, as this water will get us frostbitten. So unfortunately, we can't upward slash across this gap successfully. But what we can do is climb to this secret area and just run off the cliff there, which proves to be enough of a height advantage to grant us safe passage. Windy freezing seas is not fun. This is because it forces a ring boat section. Now you find this ring down here, and while you can manage to get it up the first stair without jumping, getting it up the second stair, in my experience, is impossible. Just due to the height difference. Try as you might, the second stair is simply too high for you to be able to suck up something from down below to get it up there. So unfortunately, that seems to be one jump required to get the ring. 
Or is it? Look guys, honestly, I have no idea how I managed to get this to happen, but as I continue to throw myself against the wall, trying and trying and trying to get out of this pit without jumping, somehow, during one of my times I spit out the ring, it actually got caught on the edge above me, outside of the pit. Again, I don't know exactly what precise geometry caused that to occur, but it did, and that let us progress through the level without jumping in this instance. Unfortunately, the boat section that is immediately thereafter does require one jump for you to dismount out of the boat, and that one, as far as I can tell, there is no way to subvert. Then later on, we are faced with this massive gap, which, as we know, Sword isn't exactly great at dealing with. We do know that Tornado is good at dealing with it, but I don't have Tornado and it's not anywhere in this level. What is in this level is fire. With fire, we can actually use its uh, fire dash ability to go across the gap and land on the second platform of this cliff over here. Now, fire can't do anything to get up further on the cliff from here, but luckily we are just close enough here to summon in Bandana Waddle Dee, who can then helicopter his way to victory. That just leaves a mini boss rush left before the world's main boss fight. And honestly, the highlight of this level is probably the patience required from this vending machine section. Anyway, now to fight King DDD. Like all of the other boss fights, it's not jump heavy, so Volcano Fire works just fine for defeating him completely jumpless. Now, for the next world. Starting with the wastes where life began. Getting this first Waddle Dee without jumping requires a bit of sacrifice or damage boosting, as you might call it, but it is possible. Rings come up a few times in this level, but aside from that first time, we mostly ignore them and finish the level pretty easily. Searching the Oasis has this fast-paced, relatively tricky Waddle Dee section, which almost traps us. Luckily, Bandana Waddle Dee is there to save the day. Also, lots of water spraying, but nothing requiring jumping. A level mall, Staff Site, actually goes quite a bit better than I had expected. The platforming never becomes crazy, and while it may look like you have to jump to insert the mouthful items into these walls, that's actually not the case. This is because you actually gain a slight bit of height in the process of spitting them out, which is just enough to break through the walls. Moonlight Canyon starts off... interestingly to say the least. It begins with us scaling a cliff face. At least the initial few terraces are a small enough increase in height for the upward slash to have no trouble scaling. This one, though, is a different story. Its height is reminiscent of those platforms from the hovering tutorial. As such, none of our three different types of swords is able to overcome the obstacle with their upward slashes. And upward slashes are still the highest jump replacements we have access to. Still, the only recourse we have in a situation like this is to try and find some higher ground to platform our upward slashes from. And in this case, the only thing that comes even close to filling that bill is this rock, which seems too far away to actually be of use. It's certainly too far for normal and gigant swords. Meta Knight Sword might have more of a shot with its upper calibers, but ultimately, either you position yourself in such a way that you go off the rock with your drill stab, in which case you make it to the cliff but without the height necessary to make it up, or you perform your drill stab so that it stays on the rock, granting you sufficient height but stranding you too far away to actually make it to the cliff. Unfortunately, there is no way to get the best of both worlds here. But what can be done? This is the best jump replacement we have. Well, yes, that's true. But that doesn't mean we can't modify it. Like by patronizing this Waddle Dee's establishment to make it faster. What, you don't get how upping our speed is supposed to help us here? It's quite simple, really. We need this move to travel a further distance. And the distance something travels is a simple function of the speed at which it's moving multiplied by the duration of time it moves at that speed for. If we assume that this speed power-up does not increase gravity's effect on Kirby, then we can infer that the duration of time Kirby has to make it to the cliff will remain the same. This while Kirby's speed increases, thus allowing Kirby to travel a greater distance than before and hopefully make it to the cliff. But that's enough theory. Let's see if it works in practice. Yes! We made it. Thank goodness. We do, of course, still have the whole rest of the level to go, so uh, let's press on and hope that was the worst of it. So next up is a light bulb section. Luckily, wandering around in the dark is at least a somewhat viable approach here, 
It also helps that the light bulb likes to just sort of teleport to you. The level then ends with some more precise, yet certainly possible platforming. The silly Dillo fight is intense, but oh so satisfying to beat with Wild Hammer. That unlocks the sixth and final world. Its first level, Enter the Fiery Forbidden Lands, is where we get to try out our newly upgraded Double Drill. And really, it does great work here, leading to us uncovering many a secret and collectible. Conquer the Inferno Road is a relatively simple romp with sword, until we get to this little boat section at the end, that is. Unfortunately, the only way past this part is by way of the boat, which necessitates one jump to disembark. And believe me, I tried to see if we could skip this boat, and Tornado just was not up to the task. It just stops moving after a certain point. Now, Dragonfire, on the other hand, that can get you across, if only barely. The only issue is you need to then get fire to the end of the level, and it's not anywhere in this level, so you gotta bring it in. And there are loads of obstacles in this level that just simply cannot be dodged out of. That being said, Dragonfire is better than regular fire in the sense that you can gain at least a bit of height out of the fire dash. It's not a purely downwards trajectory. Which means, if you have perfect, and by perfect I mean just downright near perfect, angles of attack on all of these jumps, you can technically use Dragonfire to get past them. Get it all the way to the end of the level, subvert the boat section, and come out of here, zero jumps required. Burning Churning Power Plant is next on the chopping block. It's quite fast-paced fun, and requires a bit of outside-the-box thinking to get by certain of its conveyors, but ultimately, it's of no real threat to our run. Gathering of the Beast Council is a boss rush, and therefore, easy, right? Wrong. Yes, the boss fights are little more than a formality, but the in-between sections are where they get you. Take, for example, this car section, which would have required a jump if not for the car's propensity for teleportation. Or these cliffs, which are just too high to scale with upward slashes. The first, at least, can be cheesed a bit by applying some speed and activating your upward slash from this nearby rock, similar to what we did in Moonlight Canyon, though it's a lot harder to get on this rock than it was there. Unfortunately, there are no helpful rocks we can stand on to aid us in reaching the second cliff. I know those rocks over there might look promising, but they're firmly invisibly walled off from us. And don't even get me started at this friend circle, I mean pipe mouth section, which is, for the first time in the whole game, mandatory, and requires one, two, three jumps to get through, bringing our total to five. And for the Beast Pack's final stand, we start this level off with the fairly standard sword routine, but soon find that this room traps us on account of this platform being too high to upward slash onto. Luckily, these nearby canisters give us the stepping stone we need to get up without jumping. This vending machine section is quite fun, and then this boat section has me quite worried. Luckily, this boat ends up getting destroyed, so we don't have to worry about disembarking. Unluckily, this room doesn't have any canisters in it to help us escape. I even try summoning in Bandana Waddle D to help us out, but for some reason, he can't actually get through the door. So is this jump number six? Not so fast. There was an enemy just outside this room that could give us Tornado. And with Tornado instead of Sword here, we can easily Tornado across from this platform to the one with the exit. Then, after some arch fun, we replace Tornado with Drill. Now our goal becomes to get to this cone by way of this eye beam it's an incredibly precise jump, especially for the somewhat clumsy drill to have to make, but after several attempts, it proves possible. Unfortunately, as it turns out, the I-beam is made of metal, so we can't drill again from there to make it onto the platform the cone is actually on. It's certainly too high for us to be able to dodge up onto. But that doesn't mean we can't dodge anyway, and just swallow the cone mid-dodge thanks to the slight height boost that dodge gives us. And with the cone swallowed, the last bit of the level falls easily jumpless. All that remains is to fight King DDD, and Leongar, and Fecto Forga, and Fecto El Phyllis. Certainly some very nice, dramatic, compelling, cinematic fights even. But ultimately, why would you need a jump when you've got dodge rolls and semi-trucks? Oh. Really? As part of the coup de grace for this final boss, they slip in a quick time event jump in the final cutscene? Now, I don't know if anyone working at HAL has seen my Kirby No Jump videos, but 
in this moment, I can't help but feel personally attacked. Well, not going through with it isn't really an option, so jump number six it is. It's one of our last acts in the whole game. So, is it possible to beat Kirby in the Forgotten Land without jumping? Unfortunately, no. In my experience, it requires at least six jumps to beat Kirby in the Forgotten Land. But hey, I mean, that's not too bad of a result. I'll be honest, going into this, I expected much worse. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, there's no shortage of Kirby No Jump content for you to enjoy on this channel, among other types of video game challenges. And of course, if you've enjoyed your time here, likes, comments, and subscriptions are always appreciated. But anyways, guys, until next time, I've been Simicraft, and I'll catch you in the next... What the heck is that? Wait, Kirby, no! Huh. Perhaps our work isn't quite finished here after all.